Hey everyone, welcome back to Souls Game Dev Journey. If you've been following along, you'll remember that in our last video, we took a deep dive into making our game interactive. We learned how to convert mouse clicks into hex grid references, and we explored design patterns like Singleton and Observer. We've made some great progress, but as you can see, our game world is still looking a bit plain, right? It's just a grid for now. But imagine a world with mountains, forests, rivers, and other terrains. That's the vision we're moving towards. In today's video, we're taking our game to the next level. We're introducing map generation with different terrains. By the end of this session, our game world will start looking more vibrant and dynamic. We'll also touch on some key concepts like scriptable objects and threading. Whether you're here to build a strategy game or just to enhance your Unity skills, I promise this will be a treat. So, grab a cup of coffee, tea, or whatever keeps you going, and let's get started on our journey to breathe life into our game world. Alright, folks, before we dive into the new terrain magic, let's first take a moment to appreciate where we are right now. This is our current game world. It's a neat grid, and thanks to our previous work, we can identify each hex's coordinates with a simple mouse click. That's a solid foundation. But, as you can see, while our grid is functional, it lacks the flavor and variety that make games truly immersive. It's like having a blank canvas, full of potential, but waiting for colors and details. On the left, you see our current state, a blank canvas. On the right is a glimpse of where we're heading, a world brimming with different terrains, dense forests, soaring mountains, serene lakes, and more. So, how do we get from our current state to that vibrant world? That's the journey we're embarking on today. We're going to introduce individual hex data using the hex cell class and then spice things up with various terrains using the terrain type scriptable object. Stick around, and by the end of this video, our plane grid will start blossoming with varied terrains, making our game world come alive. Now that we've set the stage, let's dive straight into the heart of today's adventure, the Hex Cell. The Hex Cell class is our hero for this episode. Think of each hex on our grid as an individual with its own unique personality. That personality, its data, is what the Hex Cell class will capture. For instance, is a hex part of a dense forest or a calm lake? Is it at a higher elevation or nestled in a valley? The Hex Cell class will hold answers to these questions and more. Let's dive into the code. Here, you can see different properties of the Hex Cell class. These will store crucial information about each hex, allowing us to customize its appearance and behavior. You might be wondering, why do we need a dedicated class for this? Well, imagine having hundreds or even thousands of hexes on our map. Keeping track of each hex's unique attributes without a dedicated system would be, frankly, a nightmare. By creating a Hex Cell class, we're essentially giving ourselves a blueprint. With this blueprint, we can generate and manage countless hexes in an organized and efficient manner. As we progress further, we'll be adding more features and properties to the hex cell, making our game even more dynamic and engaging. But for now, this foundational setup is a significant leap towards a rich and varied game world. We have a reference to the parent grid and copy of some properties important for an individual cell, precalculated coordinates for all the different coordinate systems to reduce the amount of calculations, terrain information to know what how to behave, and I've also prepared a neighbor's property for later use with pathfinding and other systems as well as a reference to the instantiated terrain mesh so that we can clean up. With our hex cell class in place, it's time to add some flair. Let's talk about terrain types. Remember that sneak peek of our world filled with diverse terrains. That's our destination. And to get there, we're going to use something powerful in Unity called scriptable objects. Here's our terrain type.cs file. This isn't just another class, it's a scriptable object. Now, if you're new to Unity or game development, you might be wondering, what's a scriptable object? Don't worry, we're about to demystify it. Think of scriptable objects as customizable data containers. Unlike traditional classes, scriptable objects allow us to create instances that hold unique data sets within the Unity editor. This makes them ideal for things like, well, defining various terrain types. Here in our terrain type.cs, we've defined properties like the terrain's name, its visuals, and any special attributes it might have. With scriptable objects, we can easily create multiple terrains, dense forests, towering mountains, tranquil lakes, and so much more. And here's the magic part, within Unity, we can create individual assets for each terrain type. That is what the Create Asset menu above the class declaration is for. These assets store unique data based on our scriptable object blueprint. It's like having a collection of customizable terrain cards at our disposal. The beauty of using scriptable objects here is flexibility. As our game grows, we can easily introduce new terrains, modify existing ones, or even let players create their own, all without touching the core code. You may be wondering where I got these amazing prefabs for the different terrains. Well, I've made them with Pro Builder and Polybrush. For the foliage and other clutter I've used a free low poly pack from the asset store. 
ProBuilder and PolyBrush require a dedicated video. But if you're having problems, you can either make a simple hexagon in Blender or find an asset with hexagonal tiles on Unity Asset Store and use it for prototyping. As we venture deeper into the world of Unity, we're met with choices. Today's decision point. When to use scriptable object, mono behavior, class, or struct. It might sound complex, but trust me, by the end of this section, you'll have a clear roadmap. These four might seem similar, but each has its own strengths and ideal use cases. Let's break them down. We've just dived into scriptable objects. As we saw, they're fantastic for creating reusable data containers within the Unity editor. They're assets, meaning they don't need to be attached to game objects, and they persist between game sessions. Ideal for settings, configurations, and, as we saw, terrains. Next up, mono behaviors. These are special Unity classes that attach to game objects. They have built-in Unity events like start and update. If you're looking to manipulate a game object, respond to game events, or interface with the Unity lifecycle, mono behavior is your best bet. Classes in C-sharp are versatile. They help, they help us define objects and their interactions. They can inherit from other classes, be instantiated, and more. In Unity, both mono behavior and scriptable object are types of classes, but not every class needs that Unity-specific functionality. Sometimes, a simple C-sharp class will do the trick. Lastly, we have structs. These are value types, while classes are reference types. This means structs are generally faster to access and don't have the overhead of garbage collection. They're ideal for lightweight objects, like data points or vector positions. When designing your game, you'll often ask, which one should I use? Here's a pro tip, it depends on the lifespan, scope, performance needs, and modifiability of your data. Asking these questions will guide your decision. Remember, every game and situation is unique. What's crucial is understanding the tools at your disposal, and choosing the best fit for your needs. With that knowledge in hand, we're better equipped to design efficient and organized systems for our game. And as always, practice makes perfect. The more you experiment with these, the more intuitive your decisions will become. As we set our sights on larger horizons, we're faced with a thrilling challenge, generating expansive maps that can host our adventurous tales. But with great size comes, well, performance considerations. Look at this vast expanse. It's thrilling to imagine the potential adventures here. But generating a map of this scale isn't as simple as snapping our fingers. There's a lot happening behind the scenes, and today, we're going to delve into the nitty-gritty of it. Our trusty hexgrid.cs class is at the heart of this operation. Let's take a peek. Initially, we might be tempted to generate our entire map in the start method, but as you can guess, this can lead to some serious performance hiccups. Imagine trying to paint a massive mural all at once, it's overwhelming. Instead, we can break it down into manageable chunks. That's where I enumerator and task come into play. Using iEnumerator, we can spread the map generation over multiple frames, preventing our game from freezing up. We can decide on controlling for time by keeping track of elapsed time, or the batch size. This way we can prioritize speed versus frame rate. But what if we could also offload some of the heavy lifting to a separate thread? Enter task. It allows us to run computations in the background, making the process even smoother. Always keep in mind, game development is as much about optimizing the player's experience as it is about bringing creative visions to life. And as we continue our journey, we'll equip ourselves with more techniques to do just that. Let's dive deeper. Threading is all about managing multiple operations, but it's not without its challenges. Let's start by dissecting our two main tools, tasks and coroutines. Tasks in C-sharp are powerful. They allow us to offload heavy computations to background threads, freeing up our main thread. This can be game-changing for operations like pathfinding, where calculations can be complex and time-consuming. However, there's a catch. The Unity API, which includes all the functions and features we use to manipulate game objects, scenes, and more, is designed to run only on the main thread. This means that if our task tries to directly interact with Unity-specific objects or features, we'll run into problems. The solution. We can either copy the necessary data before starting the thread or ensure our task focuses solely on non-Unity tasks. Then we have coroutines. These beauties run on the main thread, making them ideal for Unity-specific tasks. E to do something in an interval or generate parts of our map frame by frame. Coroutines are your best friend. But, like all tools, coroutines have their limitations. Since they operate on the main thread, overloading it with coroutines can bog down our game's frame rate. It's like asking a juggler to handle too many balls at once, eventually, they'll drop one. Let's have a look at how we've used both of these tools for the final result in the hex grid script. Right off the bat, we see a task named hex generation task. 
think of a task as a promise. It promises that some work will be done, possibly in the background, and when it's finished, we can collect the results. As you can see by the type, this task will return a list of hex cells. In the start method, we initialize our task. Task.run means we're asking it to begin its work. And what's its job? To generate hex cell data. This method creates data for our hex cells, but just as we discussed before, it can't access anything using Unity API related. Instead, we focus on non-Unity related calculations, such as creating a hex cell object, setting and calculating properties, determining terrain type and building a list of all the generated cells. This list is what we will return to the main thread at the end. Now, in the update method, we keep an eye on our task. Once it's done, we grab its results, notify other parts of our code that the map info is ready, and then start a coroutine to instantiate the cells. In this method, we're creating terrain for our cells. But instead of doing it all at once, we're doing it in batches. After creating a certain number of terrains, we pause using yield return null, letting the game breathe before continuing in the next frame. The events, like on cell batch generated, give us a way to communicate the progress. Imagine it as a chef shouting order ready, in a bustling kitchen. As we close this chapter of our journey, it's important to reflect on our progress and set our sights on the horizon. You might have noticed some parts of our code or map aren't behaving quite as we'd like. That's okay. Game development is an iterative process, full of experimentation, learning, and refining. While there are aspects we'll need to revisit and tweak, rest assured, we're on the right track. Speaking of tracks, I've got some exciting news about our next destination. In our upcoming video, we'll be evolving from randomly selected hexes to a truly captivating map generation process. We're diving into the realm of map generation techniques, where we'll breathe life into our world, creating mountains, valleys, forests, and more. And here's the cherry on top, we'll be introducing a range of settings, allowing you to fine-tune your map to your heart's content. Whether you want dense forests, sprawling lakes, or towering mountain ranges, you'll have the tools to shape your vision. So, as we wrap up today, remember, every step, every challenge, every piece of code is part of our grand adventure in game development. I'm thrilled to have you on this journey, and I can't wait to see where we go next.